Hi and welcome. My name is Dr. Pamela Tosh. I am a professor here at University of Wisconsin Platteville and I'm also part of the I Prefer Network uh, working with Pennycrest to create biodiesel and green aviation fuel. What I'd like to share with you today is how to make biodiesel, what, we, what crops we use to make it, and what that process looks like. So in order to get started, first we have to ask the question of what is biodiesel? So we have a lot of uh, commercial vehicles, we have a lot of cars and trucks on the road that all use diesel. And biodiesel just simply means diesel, the fuel, instead of it being made from fossil fuels, which were made from dinosaurs and plants that died eons ago that have been buried under sediment and then that oil has been extracted up and converted into fuel, we make it out of plants. So the question always comes up, which is better for the environment, regular diesel or biodiesel? And it's an interesting question. The first part of that we can think of as our tailpipes emission. When you have a fossil fuel that is locked away underground, we first have to extract that fossil fuel out. That process of extraction is pretty energy intensive and then when we finally bring it up to the surface, it has to go through fractional distillation in order for us to get the kind of hydrocarbons, that word hydrocarbon meaning a molecule that is largely composed of carbon and hydrogen, to make those hydrocarbons the correct size um, and with the right properties that we want for fuel. So when you have a fossil fuel, you take it from the ground, you bring it up, you then process it, you put it inside of a car or a truck, and then we end up burning that fuel, combusting it, to power the vehicle forward. In the process of combustion, while we're burning it, that's where we really release a lot of that CO2. And when we talk about climate change and the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere, the transportation sector is one of the largest contributors to it for that very reason. When we're burning biodiesel, we're still creating those hydrocarbons. Well, the plant's creating those hydrocarbons. We're extracting it. We're converting it into the size that we want and the properties that we want. And then we're going to take that biodiesel and we're going to put it inside of a car and then that car is going to burn it and push itself forward. That too is going to make carbon dioxide. And so the question becomes, does biodiesel produce less carbon dioxide or more? Well, typically in a gallon of regular diesel, about 22, 23 pounds of carbon dioxide is produced for every gallon. If we look on the biodiesel side, let's say we have 100% diesel made from a plant instead of a fossil fuel, it's going to be around 18 to 19 uh, pounds of CO2 produced per gallon. You are getting a savings, right, 22 to 23 pounds versus 18, 19, 20 pounds of CO2, but it's not as much as people often think it is. Well, that might be true, a couple pounds saving per gallon, how many cars on the road, how many trucks on the road using it. It can become quite a lot at the end of the day. We can think about what's 1% for $100 versus what's 1% on a million dollars, right? If we scale it up, we do have more of a saving, but truly where the saving of CO2 and the environmental impacts of biodiesel really come into frame is that fossil fuels is kind of a, a one-way ticket up. It starts in the ground, we pull it up, we pump it, we refine it, it goes into your car, and then it eventually, once it's burned, it goes into the atmosphere. That's a one-way cycle. For biodiesel, on the other hand, first we have to grow a plant, and in the process of growing that plant, that plant is consuming, it's taking up carbon dioxide, carbon dioxide releasing oxygen. So the plant's growing, it is releasing oxygen and taking carbon dioxide from the air, and then we convert it into biodiesel, right? We take the plant, we process it, we make biodiesel from it. Then we put that biodiesel into a car, the car burns it, and then releases that CO2. So on a biodiesel side, really what we're doing is recycling the carbon dioxide in the air. We're actually also using less the plant is also consuming more carbon dioxide than it's putting out when it comes through the tailpipe. So there is actually a net benefit. Not only are we recycling that carbon dioxide in the air, but less of it is, is coming out in the process. But, but really your savings comes from that idea that you're growing something and in that process of growing, we're locking onto that CO2. We're temporarily holding it in the form of a plant. Okay, that's a really 
brief description of, of what regular diesel is versus what biodiesel is, let's talk about how we make biodiesel, or, or first rather, what crops we use to make biodiesel. So typically in the United States, soybean is a very popular choice for, for pressing to use as oil. We use it in cooking oil. We also use it to produce biodiesel. An alternative to that could be something like canola oil. Although canola oil really has a, a very high market value as a cooking oil, so generally it's pushed through those pathways instead of a biodiesel pathway, but is absolutely used by processors and can be used. Sunflowers are another alternative to use to making biodiesel. Um, and things like peanuts can be used to make biodiesel or palm oil or, or a lot of these other uh, seed crops that we know have a lot of oil content in it. That's what brings me to, to really what I want to talk about today, aside from making biodiesel, but the plant that we use to make it. So I'd like to introduce us to not that new of a plant, uh, but, but maybe new to this use. So this is pennycress. This plant, it's now been dried, right? It, it grew over the summertime and we harvested it and now it's dry. But this plant, while it doesn't look very big or like much, can produce just as much oil per acre as a soybean field can. This plant, once it grows, it'll get about uh, two to four feet tall. Four feet's kind of big. Let's say two to three and a half feet tall at most. And it's got some really interesting properties. Now, here at the I Prefer Network, we're looking at commercializing pennycress specifically for the Midwest region. What our aim is, is that pennycress can be grown in a pretty non-traditional way. Most of our crops here in the Midwest, whether it be soybean or canola or even sunflowers for that matter, most of them we have to plant them in spring, usually in May, late May to beginning of June. Then they grow all summer long and then we harvest them either in August or early September. That's the first difference with pennycress. So with this plant, you can actually grow the seeds in fall. After a field has been harvested with corn, let's say for an example, since a corn soybean rotation is very common here in the Midwest and especially here in Wisconsin where I'm located, we can go into a cornfield, harvest the corn around mid-September, late September, and we can go in and we can plant pennycress seeds. Those seeds start to grow, and as they start to grow, they form something called a rosette. That's a collection of leaves right at the base. Another really interesting fact about that is as that plant is growing, those roots are growing. So, so throughout the rest of September into October, even into November sometimes, this plant is growing in that field. Because those roots are growing, and because uh, the roots are, are, are really in that first couple inches of soil, I would say within the first uh, five inches or so of that soil, those roots act to hold that soil in. We call it soil erosion. That's the process where soil actually erodes or runs off of a field. A field might have a foot of top soil, let's say in 1970, and then as soil erosion has hit it every year, that foot will get smaller and smaller and smaller. So what pennycress does by planting it in the fall is we're, we're putting something on that field with roots that really help to lock in that soil structure. Also, most of the time through conventional farming or even organic farming, but, but through farming in general, in the summer when plants are growing, we're putting nutrients on that field, whether it's nitrogen or potassium, and those nutrients sometimes are put in an excess. Well, what happens when we put too many nutrients on a field and the plants that are growing there don't uptake all of it? Most of those time, those nutrients run out of the field, they go through the soil and into our water table. So growing a crop in fall not only helps with soil erosion, but now we're actually absorbing some of those extra nutrients in a plant. Okay, the plant grows, now it's getting cold, it's winter time, the plant uh, hibernates, if you will, it goes through a winter dormancy period, and in spring, pennycress is one of the first things to come up. That has a lot of side benefits that sometimes we don't always talk about. So in spring, one of the first things to come up, right, are grasses and, and a few flowering 
uh, plants, but, but not many of them. So Pennycrest offers pollinators, like insects and bees, an ability to get some nectar, to get some pollen right at that beginning of the season uh, and allow them to really have a much stronger colony uh, as they're going, going through the rest of the year. So because it's the first thing that comes up in spring, it works as a good pollinator, but that also means that it's a pretty fast grower. It's the first thing up, so it gets to capitalize in a field for all of the light, and it doesn't have a lot of weeds to compete with. After it grows, all through, let's say, March, maybe it'll start growing, then in April, we can go in and harvest pennycress in mid-May to late May, just in time for a farmer to come in and plant a normal rotation crop, let's say soybean, in June. So pennycress acts as something we call a winter cash cover crop. A cover crop, because we're planting it in the off seasons of a field, a cash cover crop because once we plant it, once it grows, once we harvest it, we can take these seeds that live inside this really, really little pod. In a moment, I'll show you exactly what those seeds look like. And we can crush them for oil. And then once we get that oil, we can make biodiesel from it. OK, so that's diesel versus biodiesel. And now we talked about some of the crops that we can use. Traditionally, it was soybean or canola. Now we've talked about pennycress and trying to commercialize it for our Midwest region of, of why this plant can really help not only farmers, but also the ecology and the water and the pollinator crops. Let's talk about how we actually make biodiesel, right? What's, what's the process or the key for that? So the first thing we have to do when we make biodiesel is we have these seeds and we have to press the seeds to get the oil out. In pennycress, uh, even though the seeds are very small, they have about a 25 to 35 percent oil content. So we're going to take those seeds, we're going to press it, we'll see what that looks like in a moment, and then we have to go through a set of chemical processes called transesterification. So let's take a look at, at what transesterification means. When we have the oil, we've already pressed it, we need to take those lipids and create biodiesel from it. It sounds maybe more complicated than what it really is. So we know lipids by another name. We usually call them fats. So sometimes you'll hear them as called fats or oils. Maybe a more technical or proper name is lipids. But a plant has a lot of different kinds of fats. There's something called phospholipids, which live in the membrane, the plant, the cell membrane of a plant. There are waxes which act, you know, there's a lipid. If you ever have felt a wax or a candle, um, it feels maybe a little greasy and water doesn't like to beat up on it. It's because it's hydrophobic. Uh, another type of lipid is something called a terpenoid um, or terpenes can be lipids. Uh, aromatic compounds like essential oils are actually lipids and something called triglycerides. Now triglyceride is a really neat molecule because it's one of our most preferred storage molecules. Let's take a pause and think to ourselves, what is the point of a lipid? Why do plants make these lipids? Why in fact do humans and other mammals make these types of lipids? Lipids are really great storage molecules. We know that we need energy to live. Right? We need to eat, and by eating, we are fueling our body, and by fueling our body, we're able to go through all of our daily activities. A plant is really no different. They need to eat too, and they need to, to use this energy to go through all of their cellular processes. So what a plant does is first it goes through photosynthesis, which is when we take light photons, so the sun is coming down, in waves, but also in, in photons and particles. And, and those photons hit a leaf, specifically the chloroplasts inside of it, and they can use those photons carry energy, they can use that type of energy to create sugar. Plants make sugar, right? And then they store that sugar or they use that sugar to power themselves. Humans, our brains, 
truly run on sugar. Now, I'm not saying go home and eat a bunch of candy and that all sugars are equal. Obviously, we know that there's white refined sugar and then things like apples and oranges have a different kind of sugar in them. And, and so there's a lot of different ways that we can quantify sugar and how we identify sugars. But, but the moral of this story is that, yes, our brains, our body, work specifically on a sugar molecule called glucose. Well, we can't always keep a bunch of glucose in our bodies. They would get consumed like that. So instead, we, our bodies, evolution, figured out a way to, to take all of that energy that we would get from these molecules and store them in something called a triglyceride. So when you've got some fat on your body or when we've got a seed, like an avocado seed or, or um, a coconut, something like that, coconuts are seeds too, their main storage unit is a triglyceride. And that triglyceride is the key of what we need for making biodiesel. So let's take a look at what a triglyceride looks like from a molecular level. So a triglyceride starts off with a backbone of carbon and hydrogen. And this backbone is connected in a straight line down, and then next to that backbone, we have it bonded with oxygen. That oxygen is bonded to a carbon that has a double bond with another oxygen. And on the other side of that carbon is something called a long uh, fatty acid chain. So that fatty acid chain is primarily made up of a hydrocarbon. So remember at the beginning, if, if we want to go back in time, I said that fossil fuels were made of different kinds of hydrocarbons, different sizes of hydrocarbons. Plants have those hydrocarbons too. Let's remember what's inside of crude oil. It was dead plants and animals, right? So, so those hydrocarbons are very similar to these and so next to it we can make our hydrocarbon chain. Now there's a few ways you could show this. You could draw a bunch of carbons right all the way down. Maybe this hydrocarbon chain has eight carbons in length. Maybe it has 12 carbons in length. Maybe it has 25 carbons in length. One way we can show that is writing a bunch of carbons and then writing all the hydrogen that are attached to it. But this kind of looks a little messy, right? We can imagine that if there's a lot of carbons here, that's going to fill up a lot of space. So chemists, they like to do shorthand. We like to do a lot of shorthand. So another way that we draw hydrocarbons is in a line diagram. So we'll make it look something like this, right? Where each connector, each point here, I'll, I'll put a circle on it represents a carbon, and attached to that carbon is a hydrogen. The last way that we use to represent hydrocarbons is sometimes we call them R groups. So this would be R group one, R group two, and this would be R three. So maybe just next to this, I'll write R two and R one, just to, to wrap our heads around it. So those are the three different notations that you might see for hydrocarbons, but there's something we need to talk about before we go on further. So these triglycerides, this molecule right here that I've drawn, this is a triglyceride. We can hear in the name tri, tri standing for three, meaning we have three hydrocarbon chains attached to it. These can have saturated carbon bonds, carbon to carbon bonds, or unsaturated. Now, that's adding kind of one more layer of complexity, but different plants make different types of triglycerides. Every triglyceride has this same kind of pattern. Most humans have this same kind of pattern. We're bilateral, we usually have two eyes, it's usually in the front of our body, we usually have two arms and two legs and so forth. But me as a human look different than other humans. We have slight differences, right? Different hair color, different eye color, different height, etc. Triglycerides have slight differences too, differences in their carbon length, and differences in how saturated 
or unsaturated those bonds are. So maybe if we wanted to show what a saturated bond would look like, we would draw it like this. This represents a double bond and shows the saturation. Now when we're making biodiesel, some plants are better to make biodiesel, some seeds are better to make biodiesel with than others. And, and when we say, when we look at those differences, some of it has to do with how saturated it is. We kind of already know this. If you go inside your fridge or you look on your counter, maybe you have some butter. And is butter a liquid or a solid at room temperature? Generally, it's a solid. Maybe not really hard solid, it's kind of soft, but it's still a solid, it's not totally liquid. But when you have something like olive oil, generally speaking, olive oil is a liquid at room temperature. So things that are more saturated, things that have more saturated bonds are solid at room temperature, and things that have more unsaturated bonds are liquid at room temperature. Pennycrest is great because it's got a nice balance between it, and when we press it for oil, we get a liquid at room temperature. So it's got more unsaturated bonds than something like coconut. Maybe if you know coconut oil, that can really be a liquid at room temperature if it's like 68 degrees or even 70 degrees. It might still um, be solidified. Very quickly it'll become a liquid, but it'll start off as a solid. So, okay, back to triglycerides. So we have this molecule here, and our goal to make biodiesel is that we want these R groups to be by themselves. That's our goal. We want them to be by themselves so that we can use them in our fuel. So how do we make it? We take these triglycerides, we press the oil inside the oil as triglycerides, and then we add, and there's a few ways to do this. Uh, for this lab, for today's video, we're going to use methanol, uh, but, but there are other compounds that you can use for it. But we're going to use methanol, and methanol is CH3. Remember, that's methane, <coughs> and we're going to turn it into an alcohol. So now it's methanol, and then we're going to add a catalyst. A catalyst, remember, is something that is used in a chemical reaction to make that reaction happen quicker. However, it itself does not get consumed in the reaction. So some common catalysts are sodium hydroxide, NaOH, or potassium hydroxide. Today for our lab, we'll be using potassium hydroxide as our catalyst. So we have our triglyceride. We're going to add some methanol. We're going to add some catalyst to it, and what we're going to do, let's use a different color marker here, is we're going to break this apart. So we want to break this apart right here. Remember, we have this backbone, and that backbone makes it really hard to work with. So what we're going to do is we're going to take these three OHs, and they're going to come over and they're going to combine with that backbone. And when they combine with that backbone, they're going to look something like this. We still have the backbone. We haven't changed it at all. It's still there. It's that same structure. But now, we're going to add an OH to it. This new molecule that we made is glycerol. If you ever wonder, how does glycerol get made? Well, this is one way that we can make glycerol. Glycerol is a really common product. Maybe you don't even realize it, but it's used in a bunch of cosmetics. It's used as a lubricant. It's used um, in food products. If you ever had a snow globe and, you know, you, there's glitter in it or, or the little fake snow and you turn it upside down and you shake it and you put it back and it gently, gently comes to the bottom, that liquid in there isn't water, it's usually glycerol um, because it's a bit thicker and a little more dense and so it kind of lets it float just a little bit more on its way down. So we're going to make glycerol and this is a co-product or a byproduct, uh, but normally a co-product of this process because we can sell it. And now, okay, we've made our glycerol, there's our backbone. Now what we've done is we've freed up these carbon chains. And so this methane is going to come over 
Remember, we have three of them. So let's just draw it. I'm going to put one here, I'm going to put one here, and I'm going to put one here just to show that they're no longer connected in any way, shape, or form. And let's add that chain. So here was our O, here's our carbon that's bonded to an oxygen, and then this is the rest of the chain. And remember, we called this one R1. Let's put R2 down here just for fun. And we'll do R3 right here. What we've created here is not quite yet biodiesel, but these are called methyl esters. So let's write that. This is a mix. This is a mix of methyl esters. Another way we call these, another way we can call them, is a mixture of fatty esters. If you're ever interested about these hydrocarbons and all the different ways we can make it, we can think of fatty acids. A lot of the foods that we like to eat and that we believe are very nutritious for us have fatty acids in them, like linoleic acid or palmaic acid. Those fatty acids that we find in those foods, they actually, this chain right here, we call this a fatty acid. Now, it's not a free fatty acid because it's tied up right to that backbone. And over here, it's not free either because now it's connected to methane. That's how we get a methyl ester or a fatty ester. But in our food, we have free fatty acids. That's where they've disconnected, and they have other properties, um, benefits to our human health. So this mixture that we've now created, right, we took triglycerides, we added methanol, we added our catalyst, we made glycerol in the, in the process of it, and now we're left with these mixtures of methyl esters. Those methyl esters, that is what biodiesel is made out of. Pure 100% biodiesel will be almost entirely just those methyl esters. Okay, so, so we, we did a lot of talking at the beginning of this video, right, about fossil fuels and what kind of crops we can use. And now we've looked at some of the chemistry that goes behind making biodiesel. Let's actually turn around and take a look at what this process truly means or what it looks like uh, in the making. The very first thing that we're gonna do is press Pennycrest for oil. 